we're going to be talking about gluconeogenesis in this video. And by the time you're done watching it, I want you to be able to describe the relationship between glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. I want you to be able to list the names of each of the enzymes of gluconeogenesis that bypass the irreversible steps of glycolysis. I want you to describe what the malate alpha-ketoglutarate transporter is and what problem it solves. And finally, I want, to I want you to be able to, to list some of the common sources of reactants uh, for gluconeogenesis. Now, the part of metabolism that we are looking at here, if we look on this, this map of met met metabolism, is we're looking at converting pyruvate back into, or I should say two molecules of pyruvate, back into glucose. And there are all sorts of different ways that we can generate the two pyruvate to do this, but we're going to focus right now on just when we have pyruvate, when we have a couple pyruvate, how do we use them to make glucose? Now, gluconeogenesis may seem like a simple reversal of glycolysis, but if you'll remember, there are three reactions in glycolysis that are irreversible under cellular conditions. We have the first one here that is catalyzed by hexokinase, the second reaction that is catalyzed by phosphofructokinase 1, and the third reaction that's catalyzed by pyruvate kinase. And now each one of these are so negative, have such a negative delta G under physiological conditions that they are simply irreversible, which means that we can't use those enzymes to go in the other direction. We cannot use pyruvate kinase to convert two molecules of pyruvate into two molecules of phosphoenopyruvate. Okay. So what that means is that for each of these three steps in glycolysis, there needs to be a uh, workaround enzyme, an enzyme that bypasses those three reactions. All the other reactions in glycolysis, so the seven other ones, notice they are all reversible under standard uh, under physiological conditions. They all have delta G's that are darn close to zero so that gluconeogenesis can use those enzymes. So gluconeogenesis just needs three ways to bypass glycolysis in step number 10 here, step number three here, and step number one there. Let's take a, a closer look at it, at step number one and step number three in glycolysis. If we wanted to go in the reverse, what we'd want to do is going from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. We'd want to pluck off a phosphate. Now, if we were to use a kinase, we'd have to transfer that phosphate group to ADP to make ATP. We know we can't use that because it's, ir or it's irreversible under this particular situation. But what's another way we can just simply clip off a phosphate and not add it to an ADP or to another molecule? Right? Same thing here. We need a way to take glucose 6-phosphate and turn it into glucose. We can't use the kinase because that's irreversible. So we need another way to clip off that phosphate. So what enzyme can we use to simply clip off a phosphate and not add it to anything? Phosphatases. And that's exactly what gluconeogenesis uses to bypass that reaction 1 and reaction 3 of glycolysis. Here we have a reaction that was catalyzed by phosphofructokinase 1 in glycolysis. Well, to clip off that phosphate group to go in the reverse direction, we use fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Okay. Here we used hexokinase to phosphorylate glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. We can't use that in the reverse direction, so what we do is we use glucose 6-phosphatase that simply clips off that, that um, phosphate group and doesn't add it to anything else. So in this respect, gluconeogenesis is pretty simple. We've got just a couple phosphatases that bypass these two kinases at step 1 and 3 of glycolysis. 
the tricky part is right here bypassing the enzyme the pyruvate kinase is tricky for a couple reasons the first is the majority of pyruvate in the cell actually lies within the matrix so when we are getting pyruvate the two pyruvate necessary to make a molecule of glucose we've got to start in the mitochondrial matrix the other problem is that this is a very uh, endergonic reaction turning two pyruvates into two phosphoenol pyruvates and so it requires a bunch of high energy molecules and it's going to require two steps to do that the first step um, uses one ATP per pyruvate to carboxylate pyruvate into oxaloacetate. Now oxaloacetate is an intermediate of the citric acid cycle, so it's got importance on its own beyond uh, the gluconeogenesis. And then what's going to happen is we are going to phosphorylate the two oxaloacetate using two molecules of another high energy molecule, uh, GTP, very similar to ATP. And that's used to phosphorylate the two of them into two phosphoenol pyruvates. Let's take a look at these two reactions in a little bit more detail. So the first one, the carboxylating of pyruvate to oxaloacetate, is required is dependent upon a, the hydrolysis of ATP. So here we need bicarbonate. This is going to be our source of the carboxyl group. We need an ATP. This is going to, this is the reaction we're coupling to it and is going to power this and make it exergonic. And it requires the enzyme pyruvate carboxylase. This is pretty straightforward because what are we doing? We are carboxylating pyruvate. So pretty easy one to remember. Here's our pyruvate. All right, this is our 162534 carbon from glucose. And we are going to add to this methyl group here a carboxyl group from bicarbonate. And there we have oxaloacetate. Now, this occurs twice, right? We need to do this to two pyruvates. And it is going to occur in the mitochondrial matrix. What we're doing here is this carboxyl group is going to be the first thing to leave uh, when we convert oxaloacetate into phosphoenol pyruvate. So it's just there to activate our pyruvate. Now we need this oxaloacetate to leave the mitochondrial matrix and enter the cytosol. The problem is that there is no transporter for oxaloacetate that allows it through the uh, inner and outer membranes of the mitochondria. But there is a malate alpha ketoglutarate transport. And the relationship between oxalo and malate is just one of one is the reduced version of the molecule, one is the um, oxidized version of the molecule. So what do we do? We simply use malate dehydrogenase to reduce oxaloacetate to malate. Now our malate can slip through that transporter, get into the cytoplasm where there is a cytosolic malate dehydrogenase enzyme that converts or oxidizes malate back into oxaloacetate. So now we have oxaloacetate within the cytoplasm and we are ready to convert it into uh, the phosphoenol pyruvate. So here we have our oxaloacetate, and we need to phosphorylate it, number one. And number two, we need to get rid of that carboxyl group there. And so all of this happens using an enzyme called py uh, phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase. Carboxy, because we're getting rid of this carboxyl group. Kinase, because we are also phosphorylating. So here is our GTP. This is the phosphate group that is going to go into our phosphoenol pyruvate. And then this is the carboxyl group that we're going to lose. And so at the end of this reaction, and we have to do it twice, each one is going to cost us a GTP, we end up with phosphoenol pyruvate. Okay. So what we've done here then is we have had to spend two ATP and two GTP to convert our 2-pyruvate into 2-phosphoenol pyruvate. We had to invest quite a bit of energy into this reaction to get it to run. Now, from here, everything else, we can use all of the enzymes of 
glycolysis in the opposite direction until we reach three here, and then we have that uh, fructose 6-phosphate phosphatase. And then in, right here in reaction one, we have the other phosphatase, okay? And then we end up with glucose at the end. Now, when we are counting up just how energetically expensive it is to convert 2-pyruvate all the way back into glucose, don't forget this reaction here that we're using in the opposite direction. It consumes 2 ATP. So if we do a tally here, both gluconeogenesis, negative 16 kilojoules per mole. Glycolysis, negative 63 kilojoules per mole. They're both exergonic reactions. All right. The difference being is that gluconeogenesis consumes a whole bunch of high energy molecules, 4 ATP, 2 GTP, 2 NADH, and glycolysis produces high energy molecules, 2 NADH, 2 ATP. Okay. So they're, they're both irreversible undercellular conditions, and that can only happen because they are not literally true reversals of each other. Gluconeogenesis has those three extra reactions that bypass the three irreversible reactions of glycolysis. So it's important to know it's the only way both of them could be irreversible under cellular conditions. Now, there are several common entry points into gluconeogenesis. Basically, there are several ways a cell, when a cell decides, uh-oh, we need glucose badly, and we don't have enough storage um, we have several ways to do it. In plants, there is CO2 fixation. We're going to have uh, that animal cells don't have, and we'll talk a lot about that later in the course. The glycerol from dry from fats from triacylglycerols can be used. Uh, lactate can be used, as can amino acids. So let's take a look at some of this. Here is lactate. And we can take that lactate and we can oxidize it using a molecule of NAD plus into pyruvate using lactate dehydrogenase. This is just the reversal of fermentation. And this reaction occurs quite often in something called the Cori cycle. Whereas in muscle cells, those muscle cells are constantly, if they're fermenting, 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 uh, they are constantly producing lactate. That lactate is sent through the blood to the liver, where through gluconeogenesis, the liver is converting that lactate to pyruvate and then back to glucose, which it can then send to muscles. And so we have this beautiful cycle here called the Cori cycle. Now, there are a ton of amino acids that are glucogenic, which means they can be converted to glucose. And these enzymes, or excuse me, these amino acids are first converted into intermediates of the citric acid cycle. Now, we haven't talked about it yet, and we'll get to it soon. So all of these arginine, glutamate, glutamine, histidine, proline can be converted to alpha-ketoglutarate, which then can be converted to oxaloacetate, bang. Now we're in familiar territory. That oxaloacetate can be converted then eventually to glucose. Uh, isoleucine, methionine, threonine, valine can all be converted to succinyl-CoA. That's an intermediate of the citric acid cycle. That can be converted to oxaloacetate. Boom. We're in familiar territory. One important thing here is we haven't discussed acetyl-CoA, but acetyl-CoA is uh, what pyruvate can be converted into, but we can't convert acetyl-CoA into glucose. That particular step is irreversible. Right? And we'll talk about the importance of that uh, later on in the, um, in the course. Glycerol. Glycerol is one of the main components of fats. Where glycerol is that one, two, three carbons with a hydroxyl, with a hydroxyl, with a hydroxyl, and then you add three fatty acids, one to each of those hydroxyl groups. You got yourself a triacylglycerol. You've got yourself a fat. Well, now those fatty acids cannot be used to make glucose. However, the glycerol backbone can. Through glycerol kinase, we can convert it to glycerol phosphate. And then glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase, we can convert it into dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Boom. We are now in the middle of glycolysis, and we can either go down to make pyruvate, or we can go up to make um, glucose. 
So review this video, review the other videos, and be able to describe the relationship between glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. List the names of each of the enzymes of gluconeogenesis that bypass the irreversible steps of glycolysis. Describe what the malate alpha, alpha ketoglutarate transport is and what, the problem, what problem it solves. And finally, list some of the common sources of reactants for gluconeogenesis.